what can we do as academic librarians to better prepare ourselves for what is certainly an uncertain future? We just have to think more entrepreneurially and look for these opportunities. Hello, I'm Paul Zenke. I'm the instructional designer at the University of Minnesota Libraries and an Education Futures contributor. I'm so happy to be joined today by Stephen Bell, the Associate University Librarian for Research and Instruction at Temple University. Stephen is also the current Vice President and President-elect of the Association of College and Research Libraries, ACRL. Stephen's most recent book, co-authored with John Shank, Academic Librarianship by Design, A Blended Librarian's Guide to the Tools and Techniques, lays out a new vision for designing the future of academic libraries, enabling librarians to become indispensable partners in teaching, learning, and research. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for speaking with me. You're welcome, Paul. Glad to be here. Stephen, your work has helped codify the concept of the blended librarian. What are blended librarians? What new skills do academic librarians need to develop? Going back a couple of years to when the blended librarian concept was originated, the idea uh, heavily influenced by trying to increase the value and importance of the academic library by trying to immerse it, embed it into the teaching and learning process at the college or university. And so how would we do that? How would we become better collaborators with faculty and colleagues in IT and educational technology and uh, speak their language and communicate with them and, and develop uh, cooperative projects. Uh, I was influenced quite a bit by having taken uh, courses in instructional technology and design and working with uh, a lot of designers uh, at my institution where we had a very heavily uh, heavily influenced design curriculum. And so with John Shank, uh, who is also an instructional designer and technologist and a librarian, uh, you know, we came together with this idea that uh, you know, we could increase our skill sets and include new things that were not considered traditional part of librarianship, certainly not things that most of us would have learned at library school. And so we wanted to share those ideas, and uh, we wrote some articles, do presentations, and we developed an online learning community uh, that's found on Learning Times Network. And uh, we found that a lot of people were interested in these ideas. Stephen, for people outside of the academic library world, what are you most excited about? What interesting things are happening right now in academic libraries? I'm not, I think I'm not as concerned about what's happening with change in academic librarianship as I am about what's happening with change in higher education. You know, if we're not paying attention to what's happening in higher education and how that's changing, uh, we're not going to be uh, equipped to provide the kinds of services and resources that meet the changing needs of our institutions. And uh, I wrote recently about something that I called alt higher ed, A-L-T dash higher ed, in which uh, I became very interested in this kind of alt movement that started with um, alt careers, which is for people that have PhDs, but they want to move into some other role than traditional faculty. They were calling that the alt career movement. And I think you can take that to alt textbooks for open textbooks, alt scholarly uh, communications, there's any new way that we're trying to innovate and do different things. And uh, I think if you look at what's happening in higher education, this uh, concept of the unbundling of higher education where you have all these new disruptive providers who are coming at the student with a course here, a course there, whether it's a massively open uh, course or you know MITx. And what we're seeing now is uh, providing credentialing, badges, you know, really moving in a direction that's far, far away from, you know, this traditional idea of I go to the same institution for years and I get a diploma when I take in 120 credits. You know, it's changing very rapidly. And so what I've become really interested in now is how do we, how do we be a part of that and uh, make libraries relevant in what could be a very different higher education environment. You mentioned MITx and massive online courses. What do you see academic libraries fitting in this new ecology of options? Well, yeah, I think there, are, there could be some opportunities there, particularly if uh, you, know, the, you have this new, what I might call sort of the new majority learner who's not pursuing traditional paths of higher education, but taking a course here, taking a course there, you know, earning credits. Uh, is there some way that a traditional academic library could be meeting the needs 
how some of those individuals, you know, we don't really know much about who they are or where they go to get their information. We might guess while they go to the internet and they, you know, get whatever they can get. They may not have access to a lot of the content. So is there some uh, role for us in connecting with the companies and providers of these alternate forms of higher education in which we might be able to provide services in some way? And uh, is there some way we'd get some return on that? You know, everything's up in the air right now. We know that a lot of things are changing and probably just, uh, you know, for our own benefit, we want to be paying attention to all this disruption in higher education, paying attention how we can play a part in whatever new is going to be happening. Two recent future studies sponsored by the professional organizations ACRL and ARL demonstrate your profession's interests in the future. I'm curious about your response to one of ARL's proposed four possible scenarios for the future of academic libraries. This is based on the idea of faculty as research entrepreneurs. As we've discussed, the university continues to unbundle, and this scenario describes a situation where faculty seek short and long-term funding for projects, and then academic librarians become partners embedded within those funded research teams. Is this something you think will happen, and how might this impact your profession? I think you're onto something there in that you we're already seeing sort of a new wave of librarians who are becoming much more embedded in research teams. And there have been some examples of that at Johns Hopkins University Welch uh, Medical Library. They have, are moving away from even the traditional library building and embedding themselves into the research units, uh, just going out and being a part of those teams. So you might have some scenario where, yeah, uh, faculty members might be doing uh, research more independently and connecting with a librarian who would uh, perhaps be funded in some way to be a part of that team and provide the research needs. So I think, again, that gets back to the unbundling where you might have some arrangement where you know our library could have a library work, librarian working with students from you know some, some provider who doesn't have access to a library or research support and becoming a part of, of that initiative. Yeah, we just have to think more entrepreneurially and look for these opportunities. But the scenario uh, documents are, are very helpful in getting us to think differently about what our roles could be outside of the, the traditions that we've, we've maintained for you know, all these past years. As we've discussed, higher education and academic librarianship are changing rapidly. Stephen is a leader. How do you work with your colleagues to create a shared vision for the future? How do you make sure everyone's engaged in this process? Well, one, one thing is just to have uh, conversations, to share the information, then to encourage staff to just kind of talk openly and freely about them and what do they mean, and to empower our staff members at every level to try to be a part of the change. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on here at Temple University Libraries is a user experience initiative uh, because we feel that that could be very helpful to us in the future as things change and, and people tend, you know, we can see they, they need libraries less. They, they can get so much information from uh, other places, some of which is usually more convenient than libraries and, and as people tend to say, convenience trumps quality. So, you know, we need to really work hard at, you know, what could we do to bring people back into the library? And, and I mean that physically and virtually through relationship building. Everybody in the library can be a part of that and can be a leader in some way. And I think what we've done is to, uh, through retreats and meetings, to have these conversations, to share ideas. Um, we had a project we did last year. This is a little book that we called our idea book. And it says, every decision we make affects how people experience the library. Let's make sure we're creating improvements. And the idea was that everybody got one of these. And we just asked people to write down, you know, their ideas. Whenever they got a good idea or if any idea, it didn't have to be a good idea, just to write it down. And, you know, and then we had an opportunity to, for people to share their ideas. And actually some very interesting things came out of that that I think will help us to make our library a better one for our community. Uh, so I think uh, anything we can do to get our, our staff engaged and, and be a part of that process is going to help them be a part of that change and, and to, uh, to feel that it's, that it's necessary and important. I, I encourage uh, librarians as much as I can to be leaders on campus and like, like with our alt textbook project where uh, the library is funding it and leading it with our colleagues, of course, and the faculty 
to uh, encourage faculty to find an alternate form of learning material so that they don't have to have their students buy a traditional expensive textbook. And so that's a a place, it's a perfect example where the library can take a leadership role on campus. Stephen, my sense is when people traditionally think about academic libraries, they primarily think about their collections, so the books and journals that they own. How are collections policies changing to meet the emerging needs of the university community? Well, it definitely is a shift from a just-in-case model to more of a just-in-time model. And I think it does fit in well nicely with the concept of you know, creating a better experience for the library user in the sense that uh, we are enabling them, we are empowering them to get the materials that they need when they need it for whatever research or academic project that they're doing. Uh, So from that perspective, I I think it's a pretty good thing. I think in some ways there has always been a tradition in academic librarianship of building the collection based on the needs of the user community. So the librarian selector would uh, need to become knowledgeable uh, and familiar with the curriculum at their institution, uh, become engaged with faculty, uh, learn what research they're doing, uh, know the curriculum well, so that you could build a collection around that. I think it's nice to have a blend where you still have collection experts building the collection based on their skills and their knowledge. Many librarians are uh, sub- academic librarians are subject specialists, so they come from that discipline, and they and many of our librarians try to stay very up to date with uh, those disciplines, but also uh, giving the user community this opportunity to help us build the collection and to do it collaboratively, and again to be responsive so that when they want something, they can order it quickly. Uh, we can get it very quickly and make it available to them. Uh, very rapidly. What the research has shown, and this is probably uh, very important, is that those materials that the uh, users tend to select typically get used more frequently than the materials that librarians might select. So if you look at it from that perspective, uh, it just helps to make an even stronger collection. So it's definitely a sign that we're trying to be responsive, develop a better experience for the user community members, and have a collection that's more robust. Your recent research has focused on user experience in academic libraries. And and here we're using the term user experience in a holistic sense, not just user experiences in the sense of like user interfaces on websites. Why is this work important and what have you learned so far? The entire library experience is something that we want to make better so that no matter what touch point you connect with the library, whether it's through the website, uh, at a reference desk, some other service desk in an instant message interaction, you know, all across the spectrum. You know, what can we do to create a better experience? And so I came across a really interesting document that talked about a wow experience and what defines it. And it really came from the retail industry. And they identified, uh, I think, five primary characteristics of a wow experience. And it might have been things like uh, problem resolution, how, well, how good a job do you do at resolving problems, okay. your knowledge of your, your stock, so to say. You know, how well do you know your product? You have to be an expert so you can help people very quickly. Expediting requests for help. You know, make it fast for people, convenient. Being uh, focused on the user when they have a need, you know, eye contact, showing that you're interested. All those kinds of things are very important to giving people you know, a kind of experience that will be very memorable, that will get them excited, that will make them want to experience it again. So uh, I did some research in the library to see if our type of experience equated to the experience people get in a retail And so we ask people those kinds of questions. You know, what's your library experience like? What's your retail experience like? Uh, And it it came out to be very interesting. I think we uh, learned a lot of things that that people that use libraries do value some of the same things that make for great experiences outside of libraries, whether it's in a restaurant or a retail. And so I think it informs us that we could probably do a better job uh, when we're uh, at any of these touch points. Speaking of user experience... How do you view the future of library space? At most research universities, libraries occupy a lot of room on campus, and maintaining that space is increasingly expensive. How do you view the tension between space that students use for collaboration and space that holds collections? Well, that, that's a very timely question because here at Temple University, uh, we are very likely to be starting a building project. 
And our goal is to hopefully have a new building that would be open by 2015. And so that's a question we're asking ourselves right now. Uh, how do we want to create a balance between having the traditional materials in a building uh, versus having uh, space that is directly used by the user community members? Uh, and I think that uh, one of the things we'll probably be looking at is, you know, what's the kind of reasonable amount of materials we want to have in the in the building, and whether we want to have some sort of internal storage capacity. I don't know if you're familiar with something that's called the ASRS, the Automated Storage and Retrieval System. This is a robotic retrieval system that can be built into the core of a building. Wow. And so what libraries are, have been using this for is for the exact thing uh, that you're referring to in, in the sense that we can have sort of a remote storage in the building and uh, when someone wants something from that collection, they come to a desk and they uh, make a request and robots go and find the bin where the book is and they retrieve that bin and bring it to the desk and then we just hand the user the book. So the book's are not taking up anywhere near as much space as they would in stacks because it's high density storage. So that gives you the capacity to have much more floor space for users to uh, socialize, interact, collaborate, group study. Uh, classrooms are very critical, whether it's a classroom that might be dedicated for faculty and students or for librarians to do instruction. But I think it's really important no matter uh, how you look at these things, people still seem to like having some print materials in a library. So I think uh, no matter what, we'd have s some amount of space that would still be traditional shelving. And I think it would be a question of what would be there might be the more contemporary, uh, higher usage items. And of course, uh, if you look you know, out 20, 30 years from now, if you're building a building now, it's going to be here 50, 60, 70 years from now. You know, it's very clear that uh, print materials could be uh, less and less of our collections and the right. digital content more and more. So you'd want to be, and no matter what you do, you'd want to make your space as flexible as possible so that if you do have stacks today, 20 years from now, the people running the library could potentially turn that into something that would be uh, for a much different use. But my, my feeling, no matter what, as far as the experience we want to give people, uh, I like to think about how the design of the building can be used to create kind of a purposeful interaction between librarians, students, and faculty. And you know, one of the things that really concerns me is that we don't have enough of that. Too often, we the librarians are isolated. Uh, people cannot easily engage with them. Faculty uh, are not coming to libraries as um, often as they did in the past. So I would you know, in terms of wh wh what's next for the space, I'd like to see us create an environment that draws in all the members of the community and gives them places to connect and interact. And I've seen some good examples of how that can be done, whether it's through classrooms or the way you uh, space things out or where you have the librarians situated. Um, you know, that would be uh, the goal for me to try to bring in members of the community and have them engaging with each other and having a design that makes that very purposeful. Stephen, you've spoken about new roles and expectations for academic libraries in the future. I'm interested. What things might academic libraries stop doing? One thing might be more self-service. We know that people like self-service. And it can make it more convenient for them to do the things that they want to do that are kind of that, those purely transactional things. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have a couple of self-serve checkout machines, and they're pretty popular now. Uh, actually, in 2011, uh, for the first time, we started having more of our books circulated at self-check machine than at our desk where people do it for you. That might be the sort of thing that we would do less of in the future. And, of course, uh, here at Temple University Libraries, just like many others, we already move in that direction. Uh, many of our books come shelf-ready. So instead of having, um, you know, spending as much time as we did in the past, you know, putting, uh, you know, call number tags on them and stamping the books and doing all those kinds of things, uh, they come in, they go right onto the shelf. So we speed things up, we get it to the patron faster. And the challenge is uh, moving people who used to do those old kinds of uh, things that we're not doing anymore into new things. And again, getting back to the user experience, I'm not 100% sure what sort of things we will probably do less of 
but I would hope that we'll have great opportunities in the future to uh, re-engineer the way we do our work and to take folks and get them into situations where we can do more relationship building. So, for example, e-reserves is something very common. You know, the library is the place where a lot of uh, faculty will bring their materials and want to put them on reserve for the courses. Well, what if we could uh, have a system where faculty can do that much more easily in a self-serve type of way. You know, the people who previously would have done spent a lot of time processing all that can now be freed up to do other things. And the things I would hope we might be able to do are some of the get out into the community, work directly with the user member, uh, members of the user community, interact with them, and, and try to make that experience more personalized, uh, build the relationships, uh, help them take advantage of uh, the resources that are designed to help them discover uh, new information that they might not be getting to now. I think we're, we're already moving in that direction to some extent, and there's probably more that will happen in the future, especially as new technologies allow us to do, as I said, more, more things that can be self-service for the end user. Stephen, thank you so much for speaking with me. For more information on Stephen's work, please visit educationfutures.com.